All right. So Brendan, you ready? Okay, here we go. This is for real. Go ahead, Brendan. Mackenzie, you ready? Here it comes. Good job. Over to Jack. Jack's got it. Down to Catherine. Yes, over. Well done. Yes. Okay, good enough. Well done, DeMeo, you got it. Here it comes. Okay, you got it. Down to Gavin. I think he's given it to you already, Gavin. Yep. Okay, over to Aria. And to Skylar. Well done. And look at that, we all fit on one screen. Thank you, everyone. So who's not here? Do you know your classmates? No, this is the first time you're meeting, right? This is the first class of the first day of class. So you don't know who's here and who's not here. Um, so to remedy this in the future, let's have a WhatsApp chat. Is that an okay platform to use? Does everyone use WhatsApp already? It's mainly used overseas uh, because it's free. But um, who's who's familiar with WhatsApp and can set up uh, a channel for us? We're going to call this channel History 3, and I'll tell you why we're going to call it History 3 in a moment. Who's volunteering to set up the WhatsApp? I can set it up. Okay, thank you, Gavin. And when you set it up, I think it gives you a link that you can share in the chat. And by the mm -hmm. end of class today, everyone will be in it. Okay. If you don't have it on your phone, uh, you can download the app. Or I think if you click on the link, it'll invite you to download the app. Um, there's a desktop version and a phone version. It's really handy to have both because sometimes there's a lot of links coming in and out. And sometimes you wanna access those links um, on your laptop. And um, everybody needs a buddy uh, to help us get through this class. Uh, friends don't let friends miss out. Friends don't let friends get it wrong. Friends don't let friends lose points when it's easy enough to get it right. So um, everyone's going to have a buddy and everyone's going to be on the WhatsApp channel and we're going to stay connected and we're going to move from this Zoom space into Annex Central 203. Who is in Annex Central 203 right now? Okay, well, you guys could actually almost pass objects between the two of you. How is it there? How's the classroom look to you guys? It's good, um, very empty, but. <laughs> is it a good classroom for us? Yeah. Dem hmm. DeMeo, does it look like a good classroom for us? Yes, yes. Okay. I see now why one of you has to remain muted at all times because of the echo. Well, I will be there a week from today because I will be fully vaccinated. Uh, one week from today? Yes, I mean fully vaccinated. You are? Excellent. How did you do that? Um. I did um, uh, last month, so Excellent. I contact my premier care, and uh, I did. It was was good. I didn't feel pain, so nobody Excellent. has to be scared to do it. So. Excellent. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, we will keep track of our progress towards vaccination and into the room. Uh, uh, yes, I um, after uh, was uh, two days ago. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I did another track and I am uh, a test uh, a test negative. So this is good. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think this is a, a safe way to go through this pandemic. Yes. Let's, let's end it sooner rather than later. Thank you for getting vaccinated. Um, okay. So now let's get some insight. Um, who is in the uh, adaptive interventions uh, concentration. Raise your hand. I see Hannah. I see Aria. I see Alex. Demeo, you're you're in there too. Excuse me. What's the question again? Uh, who's in the adaptive interventions concentration? You are. Okay. So Hannah, Aria, Alex, DeMeo. Is that it? Okay. Who is in um, emerging tech? Catherine, Tyler. Catherine and Tyler. Catherine, Tyler, and Jack. Okay. And just to make sure who is in urbanism? We got Brendan, Mackenzie, Lauren. Brendan. Okay, um, sorry, actually, I'm confused about, about the question. I am in the urbanism too. Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. No problem. So, Brendan, Mackenzie, Jack. Lauren. DeMaio. Andre. Skyler. So it's three, three, and seven. Paul, what, which? I'm in urbanism as well. Okay, Paul. And what's? No, that was Gavin, not Paul. Oh, that was Gavin. Yeah. Um, Paul, are you here? Um, who knows Paul? Who's got texting access to Paul? I'm going to look for the chat, I bet. It could be that we don't have, uh, OK, there is a chat. Thank you, Gavin. Gavin's got, gotten us a WhatsApp link in the chat. And uh, OK. So Paul, we're looking to find out what concentration you're in. And I believe everyone else has registered their, their concentration with me. Okay. I hope Paul's okay. Does anyone have text access to Paul? No. Like I said, this is one of the reasons we're going to have buddies in this class. Um, 
to make sure everything goes okay. So, welcome to ARC 3700, Concentration Studies. I am Robert Cowherd and I am number four. I am not the most important source of understanding. On a good day, I am the fourth most important source of understanding. Um, and I'll get into what is three, two, and one. First, I'd like to know how many of you uh, have taken the history theory zero two course with me? Gavin, no. Um, Brandon, no. Mackenzie, you were in history theory too, right? Yeah. Jack, okay, so most of you have had it. So you've heard this spiel before. I'm number four. Paul was there too. Um, let me um, get to the slideshow. Well, before I go to the slideshow, let me just uh, explain that um, because so few of you opted for the spring co-op option, uh, we don't have enough students in each concentration to offer a full-fledged version, three full-fledged versions of the Concentration Studies one course. So Mark Mulligan has asked me to run a joint Concentration Studies uh, one course across the three concentrations, which is both a little daunting and very, very exciting because uh, some of us who were around in 2008 when we launched the concentration, uh, the concentrations at Wentworth are very excited to get back to the questions of the interplay between these three concentrations because uh, these three concentrations are not separate boxes that exist uh, in isolation from each other. They are three lenses of looking at a singular world. Uh, and this should sound familiar to, do, to you because this is how we present the three concentrations back when you were signing up for um, choosing one of the concentrations to sign up for. Um, Rob Trombor got up, he said, uh, he said what he said. Um, I, all, the, all three of us said that these are lenses at looking the same, at the same world. And all three of these lenses are essential for seeing the full picture of architecture. And architecture itself is not a silo separate from the rest of the world. We used to teach architecture as a separate thing, separate from the rest of the world. Uh, I know that's hard to believe, but that's how we did it in the 20th century. And uh, we don't do that anymore, thank God. We do the opposite. We look at architecture as a way of seeing the world and a way of engaging the world and a way of identifying actions that we can take in the world to change it. So architecture, is a profession of transformation. It is a vehicle for making meaningful, substantive, and sometimes structural change in the world that we live in. And in order to identify what changes are gonna do the most and do the best job and avoid harm, we need to look at the world through multiple lenses. So that's how we're gonna engage this course uh, this summer we're going to be switching lenses frequently. And we're gonna look at the world through each of these three lenses and uh, you all are going to get a richer engagement in this topic than your classmates might otherwise get um, because you're being exposed to all three of these lenses. Um, any questions about how we're doing this? Any questions about uh, having two people in the classroom, but everyone on Zoom? 
and um, how we're going to make the transition. Go ahead, Aria. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, um, like when you think you'd be in person yourself? Um, Next week. Okay. Okay. I, I had a question. Yes, please. So I got vaccinated my second dose on Sunday. So does that mean two weeks from that day I can come in to class? According to Dr. Fauci, which is our, our guide, yes. Okay. Thank you. And we expect everyone to be in the classroom as soon as possible. This class is an in-person class. Despite the appearances right now, this class is an in-person class and we are going to be in person as soon as we can. Does this in work only apply to this class or is it for um, all architecture classes? Uh, I would uh, go by the email that Tracy sent and the, uh, the messages you get from individual instructors. It was a little awkward when I sent out my email because um, the president was supposed to send out the institute policy. And then the, the program was supposed to send out the program policy. And then if the instructors had anything specific, then we were supposed to send out our policy. But for weeks, we were talking with Tracy and Mark Mulligan and Sung Hay, and we're saying, well, uh, I think the president's going to send his message any day now. Well, he sent it yesterday, I think. Did you get it yesterday? And I didn't see it till this morning. Maybe some of you, it's email, so some of you may not have even seen it yet um, because email is email. Um, so that was awkward. So Tracy just in a panic sent it out. And as soon as she sent it out, I sent out my message. Um, I don't know what Garrick, I don't know what Troy, I don't know what my colleagues, specific arrangements my colleagues are making, but um, I trust them to do something that keeps everybody safe and uh, gives everyone full access to the content of the course. So I'm sure that will happen. A good question. So, um, so I guess in the interest of doing this hybrid right now, um, are, will you be sharing everything with us, like those Google slides you were just talking about and um, everything? Would that be on Brightspace? Is that where we should look for that stuff? Brightspace is where I'm told uh, that's where our class is being held. Is the, that's our, yeah, Brightspace is our okay. platform. So um, uh, just, just to ground ourselves and be confident that we're going to, that this is going to work. Let's let's go to Brightspace and see what's there. So I'm going to my homepage on Brightspace. And your individual Brightspace uh, page may look different. Um, but among my courses, I see this Concentration Studies 01, Architecture 3700. And I click on that. And what you'll see is a, is a lot less populated than what I'm seeing. Um, but you should see this banner. It says history 3.21. That's just like an abbreviation tag for this course um, that indicates that uh, this is not urbanism. It's not adaptive interventions. It's not emerging technologies. It's the combination of the three. And when we set up our concentration studies class, we all talk, sit down and talk to each other. And we say, listen, let's, let's, um, let's be clear. This is really, the concentration studies course is really, it's, a, it's an introduction to the topic of the concentration in the mode of the third in the three course, three semester sequence of history theory. So this is, uh, this functions, the concentration studies one course has always functioned as uh, the third history theory course. And so we're just gonna call it that because it's much shorter than spelling out 
concentration studies. And since this goes on every file name, it's nice to have short things and abbreviations and acronyms uh, are just not, they're in unethical. Maybe we'll get to that topic at some point. Um, your dashboard for this course is going to look much simpler than this. I don't know what you see when you click on Zoom meetings, um, but I'm hoping you see the Zoom link to this class. Um, you can try that and let me know on WhatsApp. So uh, the one thing you will see is the Anthropocene, um, the Anthropocene week. And let's see, let's, let's take a look at that. So that's not the right thing. Go here. Hopefully you see something like this. There's a chat, there's a reading, and uh, there's a piece missing. I'm not sure where it is. Let me see if it's... Anyway, you see the reading. Did everyone get the reading? So each week there will be a reading. And this was a very short reading. The other, the future readings will be longer. I think yours looked something like this. Um, and the expectation is that by the time you arrive each Wednesday, you've read the reading and you come into class and you access the chat. And so if everyone can open the chat now, that would be great. Thank you, Skylar. Thank you, Hannah. And so this is the location for three things. Um, the chat is the location for, um, let's go back, every, every uh, Wednesday in the chat, what we're looking for is a minimum of three contributions. And right away when you show up to class, um, it would be great if you could please um, share a one sentence takeaway that captures the most important insight from the reading. This is a time capsule. This is a, uh, this is a little bit of time travel. You are sending a message to your future self. Your future self, at some point in, in an unpredictable moment in your careers, your future self is going to find itself in a crisis, in a moment of struggle your future self is going to be looking for uh, some insights uh, at a certain moment. You're gonna be in a meeting and your colleagues are gonna say, uh, what's the Anthropocene? Or your client is gonna say, I keep hearing this word Anthropocene, and I have no idea what it is. And I don't know why we care about it, right? So your future self is gonna be in a pinch. You're gonna need this knowledge that you had way back when, do you remember back in the summer of 2021, we were just coming out of that pandemic thing and that guy taught that class at that time. Um, and we talked about Anthropocene. I could swear we talked about Anthropocene. Did we talk about Anthropocene? So that moment of truth, when you need to impress the group around you on your knowledge and your awareness and your capacity to deal with the issues of the Anthropocene, and why it matters, you need access to this one sentence takeaway. You need to get back to that moment of truth way back when. Do you remember back in the summer of uh, 2021, after you did the reading, you had a strong sense of what was important from the reading. You need to have access to that so you can adapt it and bring it to bear on the challenges you're facing in the future. This is a love letter to your future self. This is a gift gift to your future. So the font
today is a one sentence takeaway that comes out of the reading. But also the reading is not enough. The reading uh, is this dead document. It was written way back in 2013. And uh, what, is that, what does this document have to do with us and our struggles here in 2021, eight years later, right? So the second thing we want from you in the chat is one or more urgent target questions. What should we, what do we, and by we, I mean your colleagues in the profession of architecture who are sitting around you right here. Um, what, do, what do we need to attend to? What do we need to grapple with? Where is the, the most important point of struggle where we have to figure things out uh, individually and collectively. So the second thing we want in the chat is a target question for us to grapple with around the issues that are emerging out of your experience of the reading. Now you notice I'm not saying they emerge out of the reading. I'm saying that emerge out of your experience of the reading because each of you have a different reading of this reading. You have a different experience of this reading the world needs each of you to bring your world of expertise. You are the world's foremost expert on your own life experience. And we need, you need to access that expertise of your own life experience. You need to bring it to bear on your engagement with the reading. And you need to come out of it with target questions and takeaways and contributions and challenges for the rest of us. Uh, that reflects who you are, what you've experienced in this world, and what you are able to extract of value out of the reading, which includes ignoring anything that you don't care about. So you might engage this reading and say, I don't care about samurai warrior culture. I'm going to ignore that. I'm not going to bring that to class. I'm not going to reflect on that in my takeaway. And I'm not going to make it part of uh, my engagement with my classmates this week during this topic. Uh, but I do care about capitalism. Like that's something I really care about or vice versa. I don't care about economics. That's why I'm an architect. Who cares about that? I'm bad with money. I, that's why I became an architect. But it's kind of cool, the environmental aspects of this. I'm really interested in environmentalism the attitude of environmentalism that comes out of this. So different, each of you, we assume from the start that each of you are gonna bring something else out of this reading into the work we're doing together as we move forward through the lecture. And we think of Wednesday as a catapult. Wednesday is a catapult that throws us into Monday. Each week, we're gonna come into Wednesday with the individual experience of the reading. It's going to throw us in with target questions into the lecture. And then out of the lecture, we are going to be catapulted into the work uh, that we're doing between now and Wednesday and during class on Wednesday. And Wednesday is the, the conclusion. It's the climax. It's the peak experience of this topic of the Anthropocene. Um, and we do it in, with, with engage. We bring our individual analysis exercises and we bring that analysis work into our group uh, action statements, action proposals. And then we present it to each other in a forum on, on Wednesday. And we're going to do that every week. We're going to do it 11 times. So uh, it's going to be very confusing the first time. It'll be ever so slightly less confusing the second time. And this is why we need buddies. But by the third or fourth or fifth time, you're gonna say, I got this, except for getting the footnotes right. If you're like previous students, you're gonna keep getting the footnotes wrong and I don't know why. Um, maybe one of you can become the footnote doctor and help heal everyone. But um, you're gonna do this 10 times. You're gonna do this 11 times this semester. You're gonna do it 10 times for small points. And then the 11th time, you're gonna do it for big points. So think of the first 10 times as practice. 
you're expected to get it wrong. You're going to get a grade that's going to horrify you. Don't tell your parents. It's going to horrify your parents. Just don't share it with them. You're going to think it's an F, but it's probably just a B minus or a C. Don't worry about it. All will be made up. This, this is all about getting these skills down. And by the way, this is a, a slightly altered version of exactly what you did last summer. One year ago, you did this analysis assignment already, slightly altered version. Um, so we're just, we're just racing it up. You're going to do it 10 times. You're going to get, you're going to get slightly better each time. But by the time you get halfway through this, you're going to be scoring very high. And if you're not scoring very high, you're going to work with me. You're going to work with your buddies. You're going to get those footnotes right. You're going to get more out of the analysis uh, exercise. And then at the end of the semester, each of you are going to choose your own topic. You're going to do your own reading, and you're going to do a term project. And you're going to do the exact same analysis assignment, but this time it's going to be worth big points. Any questions? And we'll be going over this. I'll, you know, there'll be a very deep uh, description of the assignment um, that I will share with you. But I just want to make sure I'm not losing anyone. So we're all comfortable. Any progress with Paul? Okay. So any questions about, uh, oh, and the third thing we're, we're looking for in the chat is, you know, as things come up in the lecture topic, um, you can comment. You can, um, and you can respond to your classmates. Let's, let's see how it's going. So everybody's joined. No, not everyone's joined. Um, if you haven't joined yet, could you please uh, attempt that now? And you can ask questions about how to uh, get to this. So right now we're supposed to be adding the takeaway, any questions we had from the reading and then any comments like at this moment or? Well, this moment would probably okay. be a great moment to add your takeaway sentence. Okay. And pondering these issues that come out of the reading, uh, it'd be a great moment to uh, say, well, given this issue, we really need to, need to figure out this. And um, if you didn't do the reading, it's no big deal. This counts. This is being graded. But oh my God, the points involved are very small. I know you all want as many points as you can get right from the start. But if you didn't do the reading, please don't fake it. Um, you know, it's a short reading, but it's no big deal. It's the first time we're meeting. Uh, it's all going to disappear in the wash as long as you um, figure out how to succeed with the analysis assignment. Um, it won't matter that much. It's more of a courtesy to your classmates than anything else. This is, we use, we use grading to entice you, but what we really care about is supporting the experience of each other. Friends don't let friends be alone in the discussion. Friends don't let friends go pay all this tuition and go to school and feel like they're the only ones taking the course seriously. So what we're looking for here is engagement, active engagement, not passive uh, edutainment. We don't want you to passively sit back. We want you engaged even during this thing we call a lecture. Uh, and so this is all about active engagement. And do I need to refresh to get the feed? Okay, everyone's being shy. So I'm going to give my, I'm going to offer my takeaway. Scranton concludes by saying, we are effed. 
And this is the fundamental condition for everything we do from this point forward, comma, but how do we get out of bed, question mark. There. I guess I combined a takeaway with a target question. But I would hope that a target question would be more uh, specific, like maybe a better target question uh, might be, how does understanding that our species is living on borrowed time change the way we design a sports center, for example, question mark. But that might be, you know, this is a typical target question that's not uh, inappropriate. It's like, now what do we do? Right? And, um, and so I might see this takeaway, this um, target question show up in the chat thread because I'll be keeping this over to the side. And um, I might respond, well, any, any building has a site and the relationship between any building and its site, including the thermal barrier between inside and outside, is both impacted by and potentially part of the solution of the Anthropocene. So now see, that was a response. That was my attempt to respond in a way, uh, modeling what an architectural response might involve, might entail. Um, does that make sense? So that's the chat. And for some reason, the analysis assignment is not showing up in my version of Brightspace. Um, so uh, I'm going to have to repair that uh, probably after class. And uh, what you will see is a very thorough new and improved version of the analysis assignment. So any questions about the chat before we move on? Okay, hearing none, let's, um, let's look at some slides and see what, what we can do with the slide material. Okay, I'm going to share another screen. Okay. So there's the first slide. Do you, does everybody see that? Okay. Um, we covered that. So this is a very ambitious uh, review of the final lecture of last summer's course. Um, uh, we're not going to get through all of it. Uh, and given that most of you have already engaged this lecture uh, at the end of the last class we had together, uh, I'm going to uh, be presenting it in a, in a, in a way that uh, it introduces this course uh, more than concluding the last course. Um, so I said, um, I am number four, and you've heard this before, so we don't need to 
to uh, go into it in depth, but I'm just reminding you that everything we do together <clears throat> uh, is designed according against this reality, this approach, this attitude, that the teachers used to be considered the most important source of understanding and the students were very respectful and obedient and all of that stuff. And the industrial era uh, set up this system of education that we've inherited where the students are, the, the goal is for the students to become like the teachers. And that was the goal. And the best students became a lot like the teachers. And the, uh, and the most successful students then became the teachers. And, and so it, it set up this kind of insular, twisted, um, not healthy reproduction of good students. And um, the results have been not great, um, which is the main topic of this week's uh, lecture. This, the main topic of the course this week is the Anthropocene. Judging by outcomes didn't work out so well. So if you know uh, Seinfeld, do you guys know Seinfeld? Do you know George Costanza? Do you know how George, uh, he tries to do his best and everything still goes wrong. And so he decided, uh, I'm gonna identify what I think I should do and then I'm gonna do the opposite. Do you remember that? So George Costanza starts doing the opposite of what he think he should do and all of a sudden, he gets a promotion, he gets a girlfriend, he's, he finds success everywhere he goes. And so that's kind of a point of inspiration for this new way of teaching. Whatever we did before, let's try doing it the opposite. So instead of the teacher being the most important source of understanding, let's demote the teacher. Let's put the teacher at the bottom of the list. So the way we're doing this course, we don't want you to, to be as good as you can, as close as you can to me, that's not good enough. My generation is the one that left the planet in ruin. Being as good as your teachers is not only not good enough, it has proven to be disastrous. So do not be like your teachers. Be better than your teachers. We're gonna tell you the, everything, we're gonna do our best to help you be better than us, uh, but you can't trust us. You can't be limited by us. You have to be smarter than Troy Peters. You have to be smarter than Garrick Goldenberg. You have to be smarter than me because we're the ones who left the world in a shambles. So trust us as far as our intentions are good. We're trying to give you a boost. But if you're thinking that your goal is to be as good as us or maybe half as good as us or something like that, think again. The world needs you to be way better than us. What's the third most important source of understanding? Each other. As you struggle together and individually to be better than your teachers, you're gonna be encountering challenges that no one really understands as well as your classmates. So lean on your classmates. Your classmates are the third most important source of understanding. And when your classmates need you, please be there for your classmates. You need to help each other. A lot of what we do is gonna be individual first. And then once you've done your individual work, we need you to help each other out. WhatsApp is right there. The third most important source of understanding is the insights that come to us through these powerful tools of architecture. Our discipline is a powerful mechanism, a lens for understanding the world in ways that people outside of the discipline don't have access to. We need you to see the world in a fresh way. And when you graduate, the world needs you to see the world in a fresh way. And finally, the number one source of understanding is the world itself. 
And yes, you're going to college, you're paying this tuition, you're investing four or five or more years in all of this in order to access the tools of the discipline number two. But understand with all humility that everybody in the world, whether they went to college or not, whether they grew up uh, in the slums of Mumbai or not, they have access to the world. And in a way that uh, might be a much more powerful source of understanding, uh, a lot of people are struggling for survival. And in that process, there's something about struggling every day, day in, day out, that uh, is a very powerful teacher. Okay, questions about this? I'm gonna check in on my my chat. I want to see what's going on in my chat. So as we go through this, my expectation is that there are going to be things showing up in the chat uh, on Brightspace that, uh, I don't know, are challenging me, provoking me, agreeing with me, extending uh, these points to new territories. Who knows? Okay, let's move on to the humbling truths. I had a quick question. Yes, please, Skylar. Uh, in addition to what you were just saying, so just so I'm clear, every class it kind of seems like you what you want to see is uh, as we go through every couple of slides that there's like oh a response or just some sense of communication, even if even if it's uh, not applying directly to the slide, it, if it's just in connection to the outside world, is that still okay? Yeah, that's great. And um, you remember the Confederate monuments discussion? It's, it's, we're, you know, we learned from you that that was a good thing, that you guys were talking to each other too. So don't do it for me, do it, you know, I'm just number four, do it for each other. This is a conversation that you will be having with your colleagues on these topics for your entire careers. It's not too early to start this out. You've got a world of suffering to deal with. So um, when, when are you going to be ready to deal with it? We can't wait for you to be ready. You got you to do it, whether you think you're ready or not. Because this brings us back, humbling truth number one, the Anthropocene. The system is broken. The world, for the first time in human history, there is a profound sense that the world we are, my generation is leaving my, our children, your generation, uh, is much worse off than the way we found it. When I was your age, I knew that we were, I knew all of the, I knew about the, we didn't call it the Anthropocene, but we knew the world was on fire we knew we had to do something about it. Based on our understanding of human history, we knew with absolute certainty that we, using our scientific rational approach to the world that we've been developing since the enlightenment, we would turn this around. And in so many ways we did, we did it. I give us some credit, but fundamentally and profoundly we dropped the ball. Everything that we know now about global climate change, we knew when I was your age, we knew it. And we started to turn it around and we got distracted. We got uh, sidelined uh, and things did not turn out well. The system is broken and everything we tried was not up to the task. So the industrial, you know, and this is the way we see history. We look back at the industrial revolution and we see a moment of truth when we had the opportunity to get it right. And uh, we don't study the industrial revolution today the way we studied it 40 years ago. 40 years ago, it was a moment of promise and progress and hope. 
And now we look back on this history with a, through a very different understanding of the world. So this is an example of the benefit of looking at the world according to the lenses of the present moment. And not just the present moment, but the big present, which includes the peak moments of your career. And you've seen this, that for most of human history, uh, the number of humans, you know, humans have been on the planet for 200,000 years or so. And for most of that history, there were 10 or 100 million people. And it took uh, most of those 200,000 years to reach 1 billion humans. And we stretch that timeline out so we can see what happens. The second billion, another 130 years. The third billion, around the time your parents were born, there were only 3 billion people in the world. And then the great acceleration of 1950 and onward takes off. Now we're adding, we are currently adding another billion humans every 20 years, every 15 years, every 14 years, every 13 years, every 12 years. But wait, we see the future. And the future, we know what this is going to do. So when people, when you hear people talk about, ooh, by 2030, we're going to have 8.3 billion people in the world. Get over it. That ship has sailed. Our fate is sealed. Back when I first made this graph about 20 years ago now, uh, we knew that the world was going to peak around 2050 at somewhere around 10 billion people. Oops. That didn't work out. It turns out that the only force in human history that has significantly had an impact on this curve, not the Black Death, not global pandemics, not warfare, not starvation, not zombie apocalypse. Well, I guess we haven't had one of those yet. So maybe a zombie apocalypse, not nuclear warheads even. The only impact that causes this curve to change is the education of girls and women. Didn't see that coming, did you? When girls and women have access to education, they are empowered to take control of their reproductive rights and this curve changes. We were on track for peak human around 2050, around the peak of your career at around 10 billion. Oops, we dropped the ball in parts of Asia and throughout Africa, we dropped the ball. And women's uh, and girls' education and the empowerment of women didn't work out as planned. We now expect 11 billion around 2100. Sorry about that. Again, I can't say sorry enough times. Sorry about that. Good luck. This, when we go back to the actual scale, this, it happened in the blink of an eye in terms of the global, uh, and all the measurements of, all the things you care to measure, they all take the same curve. Whether you wanna look at species extinction, carbon dioxide in the air, methane in the, in the air, uh, the, uh, the, it, the other thing that is tracking exactly parallel to this is the economy. The more the economy grows, the faster the planet uh, decays. So sorry about that. This is the fundamental truth that defines your lifetime and your careers. Your careers will play out against the backdrop of global uh, emergency. You are the first responders as architects. You are the ambulance drivers. You are the ones who show up on the scene of the crime. And you are the ones who have uh, a part to play in 
and addressing and facing this. You are like Roy Scranton. You're heading into a war zone and the world is looking to you to uh, solve some of these problems or at least alleviate some of the suffering, spread some of the benefits to those who are most at risk in this situation. Uh, is everyone okay? This is another reason why we need a buddy here. You need um, emotional support uh, colleagues. Um, so facing this, this is back to the George Costanza thing. We probably should try doing things differently than we've been doing it because uh, the results uh, give us a sense that we could, should, must do better. So uh, this is a quote from my photography teacher back when I was in art school. Uh, Don't let your schooling get in the way of your education. And you've, I think you've heard me say this uh, last summer that we at Wentworth Institute of Technology and the architecture program, we do a very, very good job. We do in many ways better than anyone else uh, I, I know of. We do a very good job. Um, we offer you schooling that at a very, very high level. But is it good enough? No, it's not good enough. You are responsible for your education. Your educational ambitions need to exceed what the school standards set for you. Again, this is similar to what I've been saying. You need to go beyond what the school is offering. You are the ones responsible for achieving your educational goals. And um, when I had a very weak professor uh, in the spring semester one year, I got a stack of books and I read them over the summer. That's how I became a historian. I had a weak history professor. So I started reading to, because I didn't want my schooling to limit my education. Same here. So how do we do that? Did you see this video? Do you remember this? No, I don't think I did this. There are. I was never taught what laws there are. Let me repeat. I was not taught the laws for the country I live in. But I know how Henry VIII killed his women. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. Now that's in my head instead of financial advice. I was shown the wavelengths of different hues of light. But I was never taught my human rights. Apparently there's 30. Do you know them? I don't. Why the hell can't we both recite them? But I won't I know igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks. Yet I don't know squat about trading stocks or how money works at all. Where does it come from? How does the thing that motivates the world function? Not thought to budget and disperse my earnings. I was too busy there rehearsing cursive. Didn't learn how much it cost to raise a kid and what an affidavit is. But I spent days on what the quadratic equation is. I get to be plus or minus the square root to b squared minus 4ac over 2a. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. They made me learn that over basic first aid. Or how to recognize the most deadly mental disorders or diseases with preventable causes. Or how to buy a house with a mortgage if I could afford it because abstract maths was deemed more important than advice that would literally save thousands of lives but it's cool because now i can tell you if the number of unnecessary deaths caused by that choice was prime never thought present day practical medicines but i was told what the ancient hippocratic method is i've got a headache the pain is ceaseless what should i take um maybe try some leeches could we discuss domestic abuse and get the facts or how to help my depressed friend with a mental state um, no, but learn mental math because you won't have a calculator with you every day. They say it's not the kids, the parents are the problem. Then if you talk the kids to parents, that's the problem solved then. Well, this advice about using a condom, but not for when you actually have a kid when you want one. I'm only fluent to this language, but serious, the rest of the world speaks too. Do you think I'm an idiot? You chose the soul all over the political systems of like a typical citizen. Now I don't know what I'm voting on. Which policies exist or how to make them change me? We should put in good upon so when 18, I was expected to elect a representative from a system I had never, ever, ever been presented with. But I won't take it. I'll tell everyone my childhood was wasted. I'll share it everywhere how I was educated and insist these pointless things don't stay in school. Okay, do stay in school. But don't let your schooling interfere, limit your education. So, um, Every Wednesday, we're going to do a lecture 
which needs to catapult you into the analysis. And uh, as I said, I'll be sharing that analysis assignment. Yeah, you will recognize it because it's very similar to what you did last summer. And we're gonna use a lot of, uh, instead of drawing by hand, uh, what you're gonna be doing is probably a combination of uh, photographic collage and drawing. So you're gonna combine hand drawing, digital drawing, photo photographic collage to produce analysis that you can then extract and translate your observations into a short paragraph. So each one of these analysis assignments, like last summer, starts with choosing an image and engaging that image with the skills of the discipline. You observe what's going on in the evidence. You draw over it uh, by hand using digital tools, all the tools of your discipline. And as you engage the visual evidence, you are noticing differences. This is different than that, which is different than this. And there is a relationship. There's a physical relationship. There's a spatial relationship. There's a structural relationship. There are juxtapositions and there are isolations and separations. And throughout it all, there are people. There are human experiences occupying space. And that produces meaning and experience in architecture that allows us to write a meaningful paragraph. And that's the analysis. It starts with the evidence. You engage the evidence with the visual tools of architecture, the analytical tools of architecture. Then you, you, you extract meaning by drawing. And you translate that meaning into a paragraph. And then you submit it as a JPEG of the final image, a PDF with the text elements and the image and a one minute MP4 video. So we're up in our game. You're gonna make a video. Yes, you are gonna make a video uh, narrated with, um, with your paragraph. And you're gonna do that every week. It's gonna be submitted by 10 a.m. on Monday morning. And then the real fun starts. Now that you've become supercharged with the uh, understanding of your analytical example. You're going to bring that together with your classmates and work together to determine what then must we do. You're going to answer the question, what do we have to, what can, what action can we uh, support? Can we identify? What design steps, what design interventions can we develop? And you're not going to actually develop them in class on Monday, but you're going to anticipate how design can address the situations that you're looking at in the visual evidence. And then you're gonna present, you're gonna develop an action statement that grows out of the evidence that you and your classmates have analyzed. And then you're gonna present those action statements with justification uh, to your classmates every Wednesday, and we're going to talk about it. And this is basically its boot camp. This is this course is designed based on the, our best attempt to anticipate the challenges you're going to be facing uh, at the peak of your career around the year 2050, when we thought uh, the human population will be approach, approaching uh, peak human. You will be at peak career you will be taking over the firm. You will be asked to lead uh, the, the planning board of your town. You People will be listening to what you have to say more than they listen to you now. The world is gonna turn to you for answers. And it's gonna expect something that actually shifts the needle. So this is boot camp. How do we activate change? The first thing that we do is we thicken the sense of now. We, instead of starting at the dawn of time with Jatal Hoyok, remember history theory 01? If I 
if I started this course by giving you a sense of history from the beginning until now, you would get all relaxed and you'd, you know, put up your feet, you'd turn off your camera, you'd not have chat going, you would just relax and you'd let my words wash over you as the pretty pictures go by. We've all been there. So we're not doing that. We're going to George Costanza this course, and we're going to start from the future. The future as predicted by the present. This is a thickening of the present, extending it to the peak years of your careers when you might run for public office. You might, you might work for a government. Uh, you might be part of a think tank developing solutions to some of these problems. What is the problem? What is the situation in the world? Well, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai is a hint at where we're heading. Extractive capitalism is, is exploding and it is becoming a dominant force in our world. You look at, and it's not just in the Middle East, the city of Boston is, has its own Burj Khalifa in one Dalton place. And when, uh, when people move in and the lights don't turn on, uh, you're going to think of the Burj Khalifa to try to understand why no one lives in the most expensive real estate in the city of Boston. And so we're going to look at history in reverse. We're going to start in the future uh, of the Anthropocene. And based on that understanding of the challenges that you face at the peak years of your career, we now go backward in time to try to figure out where are the most valuable lessons for us in how, uh, how we succeed in facing these challenges. And again, I am not the limit to what you understand. I am uh, a platform. What I offer you through the reading, what the author of the reading offers you, what I offer you in the lecture, these are springboards. These are platforms. These are the scaffolding for you to quickly stand on our shoulders, step on our heads if, if you must, we'll forgive you. Uh, and on a good day, use us as a trampoline to catapult yourself forward into some creative solutions, some creative problem solving in the studio using your, your mad architecture skills that you're getting from this very good program, use those architectural skills to come up with creative solutions. And you have to understand the history now in order to figure out how to move forward. And so this course is a way of looking forward, taking stock of the, what the kind of challenges each of you are going to face. Each, each of you need to figure out what are the challenges you think you're going to face. And in a way, you are choosing the challenges that will define your careers. What challenges deserve your attention? What challenges deserve your time and your effort? Based on that decision, now let's take a journey back in time. Let's look at the recent past and thicken those connections between the challenges you're gonna face in the 20 decades leading to 2050 and 60, and the lessons that are available to us from what's happening in the world right now and the recent past. We did this in History 32 about how the slave ship was the architecture that produced race, the architecture of the slave ship and specifically the deck structurally created two spaces, white, free, above, black, slave, below. And for all of human history, architects, you know, when we build things, we run the risk of making a slightly better version of the slave ship. We go from very difficult uh, sitting position Lots of death on the middle passage coming across from Africa to the, to the colonies. And if we're not careful, we're going to wake up in our careers at some point 
and realize that we're just making a slightly more humane slave ship. Architecture is available to apply its powerful means and methods to causes that create great joy and benefits to humanity and causes that perpetuate structural systemic oppression. Which side of that line do, do you wanna be on in your careers? This is where critical thinking comes in. When you do your analysis assignments, you are looking for the things that matter. And so, uh, and we're not allowed to just say whatever we want. You can say what you, what you are allowed to say. You are, we only say what the evidence allows us to say. We play by Missouri rules. Missouri is the show me state. If you're not showing it to us, you can't tell us about it. There's a reason why in kindergarten you had show and share. It wasn't share and share. It wasn't tell and tell. It wasn't share and show. It was show first, share second. And here we are in architecture. We uh, are, this is an extension of kindergarten in a way. We play by Missouri rules like you did in kindergarten. You show first, and if and when you are showing, then and only then can you share. You may find yourself on Wednesday uh, wanting to say something that you're not showing. The appropriate uh, thing to do is you ask permission. You say, permission to say something I'm not showing. And then one of us will say, permission granted. As long as you acknowledge that you are breaking Missouri rules, maybe we're okay. And so because architecture means what it means because it does what it does. And the only way it does it is through spatial, formal, institutional arrangements. There's a relationship between space and form and program. And those relationships are how architecture operates. Architecture does what it does through this rich, complex, arranged ecology of form, space, and human experience. And so how do buildings mean? Here's how buildings mean. Buildings mean in four ways. Where's my camera? Four ways. Buildings mean in four ways. Denotation. Sometimes buildings spell it out for us. They engrave the meaning in the marble itself. They tell us explicitly what we want you to take away as meaning. Should we trust that? That's a good question. The second way buildings mean what they mean is by referring to other architectures that have come before. The world is filled with architecture that reproduces architectures of the past. On a good day, we don't, or actually, it's almost unheard of to make an exact replica. We as architects are constantly reproducing things from the past and tweaking it, adding our own adaptation, using different materials. You know, labor costs have changed. We might not make it by hand. We might pump it out through a fabrication. We reproduce with difference. And so when you're doing your analysis, Sometimes it's useful to understand what buildings are reproductions of what prior buildings. That's why one of the reasons why we studied architecture, history. The third way buildings mean what they mean is through demonstration effects. And this is what we do in studio. The number one thing we do in studio is we produce effects. That's what we do when we design. We want to uh, anticipate, we design anticipating the impact it's going to have on someone's experience. And we test it by drawing, by modeling, uh, in all the different sophisticated ways we have to do that. And then we test to see what the actual effect is. And then we adjust it to make it work better 
more effectively, we change the effect. So this is the big one. And then history happens, no matter what the original intentions are, history happens, things happen. Uh, meanings take, buildings take on meaning by association with the events of history that are out of their control. Just look at the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers. Um, they took on whole new meanings uh, after the events of 9-11. So here we have one building, the Lincoln Memorial, that uh, we use um, after uh, Larry Vale and um, Nelson Goodman, a philosopher. This is the example that both of those uh, scholars have used and we lean on their shoulders and it catapults us forward. Now you've got this, can you use this understanding as your catapult? And this leads us to how architects draw the world. And this is the analysis assignment. Um, remember Ryan's analysis? You guys remember Ryan's analysis? So a very clear demonstration of how this is not a diagram, but it has diagrammatic power, right? The darkness of the line weight draws us in to look at the details of the door, the details of that roof. Uh, the notations point out and, and draw meaning out of these different elements that uh, by drawing it in a very specific manner that uh, relegates some of the information to the background and brings other information to the foreground. This is what gives it a diagrammatic power without dumbing it down. A diagram is more of a cartoon assertion of meaning. You've been doing it in studio for years and years. You're very good at drawing diagrams. I can look at one of your diagrams in studio and I understand it immediately. Congratulations and thank you. You really did a good job with your diagram of simplifying the meaning, boiling it down to something very, very simple to understand in a flash. And I, in five seconds of looking at your diagrams, I get it. The analysis is a lot like a diagram. I look at these drawings and I see this is important, that's less important. This has meaning, uh, this has meaning in relationship to that. There is an interplay between the different elements. There's an interplay between the inside and the outside. All of these things are coming at me. It's not quite as immediate as a diagram, but pretty close. Like if I, if I zoomed this in and we could read it, I don't think uh, this tool allows me to do that. Uh, you'd get it after a minute of engagement. And even more so if you engage the caption and uh, the text. So uh, it is like a diagram in that there is a legibility that is faster than just a photograph would be. Here's where it's not like a diagram. It contains the actual factual reality of the architecture. It's not a cartoon of the Baron's house. It is a high fidelity capturing of the real architectural elements of the Baron's house. It's not a cartoon. There is no hard line overlay that obscures the texture, the materiality, that obscures the formal nuance of, of the architecture. We see the reality of the Baron's house and we get the analytical amplification of the experience. Questions about that? This is crucial for the analysis assignment. You don't have, you might not have a question now, but you will have questions on Wednesday when you've done the analysis assignment. And then you're gonna have questions again uh, sometime in the, before the following Wednesday, because you're gonna look at your grade and say, what, what did I get wrong? 
And then you're gonna have questions about what the difference between a diagram and an analysis is. No questions now? I have a question. Okay, thank you, Hannah. Um, actually, many questions. So, where do I start? So I'm wondering, so it says on, so I'm looking at the, um, like the assignment page on um, Brightspace. And when you say, uh, choose an image and you were talking about is it the actual image of or is it like an is it a building or does it relate to the Anthropocene can it be like an, an an abstraction or a picture or like like a scene or something like I, I'm trying to narrow it's down building. it's a building it's an actual place that is built it's not a it cannot be an architect's rendering it cannot so, so be, it be like picture of, or like a, a landscape or something it has to be a building it has to, it has to be a built environment which relate to the anthropocene anthropocene uh we hope that it gives us some insight when it comes to anthropocene okay but if you do a google image search for anthropocene you're you you're barking up the wrong tree this is not going to produce you know instead you might uh, take a look at the Oslo Opera House uh, that has that sloping marble plane going into the fjords and, you know, that, you know, think of, or look at the big U by, um, by, by big, uh, the plan from the, well, that's a proposal. Instead, look at, don't look at big U. Look at Michael Van Valkenburg's landscape architecture designs for the piers or any of those piers along the Hudson River or along the Brooklyn waterfront. Those are architectures of the Anthropocene. Yes. But wait, it's landscape architecture. Yes, it's architecture. Thank you. Okay. And then, um, so this is all like very familiar in that sense. Um, but when you go into the video animation, I also get a little confused too. So animation, like, is that very... Like, is that, um, is that very open? What do you exactly look, do you have any examples? Well, let's see, let's see if I have examples. Um, that, that leads us to the rest, to the next part of the lecture, I think. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Are you you're good? Okay, let's see what happens here. So this is an example of what you did last summer. A lot of, a lot of hand drawing, thank you very much. A lot of line work. Well done. Now take that experience. Here's where we see a situation that uh, uh, exemplifies class difference, right? So here's a situation in the world. It's very dramatic. Um, so let's analyze it. Um, and we might do something. This is a two. This is overly simplistic, but it's a it's a kind of a quick example of how subtly altering the image using Photoshop and careful selection. Notice nothing is opaque. There's a pink line, but the pink line is transparent and it's not really a line, it's a shape. You should avoid lines. All lines should be avoided. Everything should be a pixel for pixel mapping. It should be masking the actual pixels of the image itself. So that's why we'd like to have big, fat, high resolution images so we can zoom in and use that magnetic lasso or quick select or, or the magic wand tool to very quickly select some pixels very precisely with sharp edges and not others. And then you think that the transparency, uh, the opacity should be uh, he says it he doesn't want it opaque, so I'll put it down to 80%. No, no, 20%. 20% opacity, 30%, 15% opacity. Bring the opacity way down because you want your audience to still have access to the raw data of the photograph or the image. So uh, they, So we all can verify uh, you are inviting us to look at the evidence for ourselves and verify what you're saying about it 
or correct what you're saying about it. Yeah, we think you're not, the evidence supports this, not quite that. So transparency is uh, essential, both for the literal meaning of the word transparency and the metaphorical meaning of transparency. Friends don't let friends say things that aren't quite true. And so if you're trying to say something based on this evidence that's not quite right, your friends are gonna come to your rescue and help you out and help you get it better. Here's a nice example that um, is part of the PDF version of the assignment where we go way back in history, all the way back to Islamic uh, settlements uh, in a different version of this course. And we look at the progression. Uh, it, was a it was a church, then it was a mosque, then it became a cathedral. And it was at the center of this urban formation with shopping streets and then residential fabric behind it with courtyards. So in order to understand all this stuff, we use these tools of analysis to make sense of the world, of a complex world. And here's campus and let's see what happens when you look at it like a video. The segregatory effects of zoning on two Boston public schools is visible in the differences between their proximities to resources and their demographics. Boston schooling districts are carved by zoning lines. These boundaries are examples of formal ordering systems developed to separate black and Latino communities from historically white neighborhoods. Boston Latin School, located in Fenway District, oh. benefits from- So he's breaking lots of rules. I kind of don't want to show you this. He's far, let me tell you what's wrong with this. Is visible in the differences he's, between their proxy he's too far up. And their demographics. Boston schooling district- He's too far away. These boundaries are examples of formal- He's using big shapes that doesn't pick out the buildings carefully enough. Boston Latin School, Let's see what we got here. This is much better. It's down low. We can actually project ourselves into the space of the activity in the foreground. Are arguing and okay. This is what we do when we arrive on Wednesday. We develop the evidence uh, with our colleagues, and we have a forum. This is what we're going to do on Wednesday. This Wednesday, we're going to. I mean, this Monday, we're going to do it. Five days from now. Are arguing and advocating for are the, the redevelopment of these infrastructure um, infrastructures to be a form of connection between the communities that were once divided. Uh, and then, so it's they start. This group starts with an action statement, and then they justify the action statement based on the evidence that they've developed. Um, and looked at how it was originally sort of this large central highway that divided the communities within the city. But by placing the highway underground, it allowed a lot of um, upper level to sort of become these open public spaces that allowed for a lot of interaction um, with the people of the city. And this greatly um, increased sort of the walkability of the site um, and that promoted a lot of interaction within people. Um, and this all helped to reduce the zooming in automobiles on these another things. reason why we like high resolution images. Wait, he's cheating. He's zooming in. That is so effective. If I knew I could do that, I would have done it. Right. Can you zoom in? Is that allowed? Yes. Yeah. So. The notice the trans like notice the transparency. Josh. Um, I notice also that the sound is off, that um, the analysis is one thing, uh, that if the, the analysis narrative comes directly out of the evidence as you analyze it. Then when we get to class, it, it flips around. It, instead of being an argument uh, that comes straight out of the analysis, now you're using that evidence to support an action statement. So um, it's two distinct steps. You're not gonna understand it until you do it.
but it's an example of notice the sound is off and the student would improvise uh, a reuse of the image, a uh, reuse of the video in support of an argument. So these are examples that are taken from the urbanism concentration. But uh, outside of the urbanism concentration, we've used other examples. Uh, the urbanism concentration students should uh, favor these types of slightly elevated uh, perspectives from above so that we see uh, the space of human activity in the foreground and the larger pattern of the urban form in the background. Um, the emerging technology and adaptive interventions uh, analysis style uh, could use the same approach. That's totally fine. But you're more likely to choose points of view that are lower to the ground. Human eye level is an excellent uh, way to uh, generate images for analysis. Another really useful thing to do, which we used to do a lot more of, and is gonna be really crucial for those of you in emerging technology, Catherine, Tyler, and Jack. Uh, and that is uh, the use of a sectional perspective. If the photograph that you are engaging is an interior uh, view, a photograph from the interior of a space, is there a section drawing or can you imagine the section cut through the building such that you can quickly generate a section on top of the photograph and using your architectural methods to produce a sectional perspective drawing that allows you to get at the relationship between the structural formal arrangements of the building in relationship to the spatial experience of the building. This is, this is I'm very excited about teaching this, these techniques in the setting through the lenses of emerging technology and adaptive interventions because um, you know, getting into the building and having the opportunity and the excuse to do sectional perspectives is a really exciting prospect. So on, on Monday, what we'll be doing is you'll be getting together in groups. You'll be uh, sharing your analysis work with each other. And you will be generating as a group an action statement. What we do as architects is we design actions. We intervene in the world. Our designs are interventions. They are steps towards addressing some of the issues that we're studying in this course. What architectural interventions are best uh, designed to right some wrong, fix some problem, address the, the issues that we're dealing with? Now's a good time for more questions. I had a question. Yes, please. I kind of had it before, but I wanted to see where you were taking the lecture. Uh, I guess something that in a way confusing is when we look at these, I'm probably gonna butcher it, uh, entro, Anthropocene. Anthropocene, when we yes. look at a, building from it, um, which phase are we really looking into? Because you did mention that demonstration cause and the effect is kind of what we're, what we're looking for. So when we, when we kind of connect it back to this assignment where we find the building, but it requires us to be in a way, like, like what you show now is there's a lot more around surrounding it. And I, like you said, your concern was, you know, uh, not zooming out too much, you can still get a a sense of scale, what, what's a, a fair enough range to, to a building that we can use the things surrounding it to explain, uh, I guess, 
the connections of it. You know, because uh, if I do me doing urbanism, uh, if we're talking about one piece of building and other things surrounding it, how far out can we go? This is perfect. If you're looking for a, a strong guideline, this is it. The, we recognize this as the annex complex set in the Alice Hayward Taylor public housing, Annunciation Road, where we get all those gunshot alerts from uh, Wentworth Police, Parker Street. This is a very rich location for unpacking the social institutional uh, relationships through the architecture. Annunciation Road is a very different place than Parker Street. Don't walk down Annunciation Road. No one. Uh, and even on Parker Street, make sure your pepper spray is handy. Right? So you need, you know, and why is that? How is the architecture playing a role in that experience? Why, how do the spaces shape that experience? Where are the blank walls? Where are the uh, active entryways? And where's the ass end of the building? Where's the back of the building? And which is partly to blame for why Annunciation Road is so dangerous. Of course, Annunciation Road is, is dangerous. It's surrounded by parking lots, blank facades, there's no street wall. There's no engagement. It is not a public living room the way Parker Street is, especially now that we have the CEIS building, right? So this is this image is a way to access how these situations are produced through architectural arrangements. I am so sure that you have more questions, but our time is up. I want to thank you. Uh, allow you to go, but anyone who wants to hang back uh, and talk some more about specific questions, please do so. The rest, especially if, if you have to run, use that WhatsApp link. Uh, I will send it to the same mailing list I sent the Zoom link to, although it didn't seem to work for everyone. Um, and so we can continue this uh, helping each other out, asking questions. What kind of, is this a good image? How about what, what should I be looking for? Um, we can continue that on WhatsApp because you do have an assignment due on Monday. And we don't expect you to succeed hugely. Um, and you're going to get a horrible grade for it. But it's all part of the learning process. Yes, I used to do on Wednesday. I keep getting my Monday, Wednesday mixed up. Wednesday is lecture day. You'll have a reading for next Wednesday. I apologize. You have an analysis due on Monday. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Do you see the analysis so, assignment under 10 Anthropocene? Wait, quick question. Uh, so the weekly schedule, our analysis, our analyses will be due on Mondays and then our reflections are due on Wednesdays? Yeah, it's not really a reflection. It's a takeaway sentence and one or more target question that you're submitting on the chat. Jack's got it. So if you have a question, ask Jack. So I don't want to ever detain you. So thank you, everyone. See you on Monday. We'll be on this Zoom link, I, I think, unless I got it wrong, um, on Monday. Uh, and those of you who are able, I, we encourage you to get together in Annex Central 203. Um, I will be on campus at the earliest time of my vaccination that it allows, which will be next, a week from today, I will be on campus. Please join me as soon as you are fully vaccinated. That means two weeks beyond your second or your final vaccination. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm hanging back in case you have more questions. I had a, I had a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I was wondering, 